and you're live on Dead Radio. Yo, 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 everybody. Um, welcome to another episode of Dead Radio um, with your main man, Dying is Dead, powered by those nice guys at play. Um, today I've got a special guest, I think. What do you think? Think it's special? I, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but you know how we do it. If you're new to the show, we don't introduce um, the guests. We simply let them introduce themselves so they can tell us who they think they are. So that's good, bro. How are you doing? I'm all right, man. Shout out. What's your name? <laughs> My name is Fred. Right, Fred. What do you do, dude? I'm a storyteller. A storyteller. Yeah. Um, My name is actually Frederic Chimanga Kayembe. Okay, okay. But people call me Fred. Really? I actually didn't know that was your name. Yeah. So your name was not Fred? I mean, when I came to South Africa, people started calling me Fred because it was easy, so... But Frederick is easy? Yeah, <laughs> not for everyone, not when you have to get it right. It's Frederick, dog. It's Frederick. 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 How do you spell it? F-R-E-D-E-R-I-C. Oh, shit. Yeah. Mad exotic. <laughs> Mad exotic. Yeah. But yeah, where are you from? And... um. I just heard you say that you just when you came to South Africa. So like, where did you, where like where were you born? I was born in Kinshasa, in uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo. Right. It was still Zaire back then, though. Right. Uh, and then, cause my dad, well, my mom's from there originally, and my dad too. But my dad grew up in uh, in Belgium his entire life. Right. And then moved to Congo uh, after varsity, I think. Okay. And that's where they met. Uh, I was born there. My three brothers were born there. But like shortly after I was born, we left. So, yeah. And where did you guys leave to? South Africa? Yeah, I mean, I think like a couple of places. My, my uh, dad, he, he's, some of his family, like half of his family were in Belgium. Yeah. And he's, the other half of his family, I, I think, were in Canada. So there was, I was a baby, you know. So there was like a lot of travel. My family stayed in a few places around there uh, right. for some time and then I think like probably in the mid or late 90s you know then we moved to South Africa okay yeah. okay um, move South Africa and then when you get to South Africa obviously you're a kid but um, what stood out for you um, coming here and obviously getting because I'm only asking you this because of the kind of direction you've decided to take, which means like you got here and you saw something that stood out to you, which gave you some sort of um, idea of what you liked, if you get what I mean. Yeah, I, I suppose like everyone else, the like where you are is a combination of like all the factors that well, got you here. Right, right. right. But for, for me, it was, it was an interesting, uh, it was an interesting upbringing because when I got to South Africa, it was like, you know, I couldn't speak any of the languages. I mean, none of my family could because we, I mean, we spoke French at home. Right. And then like our native tongue is a, it's a language called Chiluba. Okay. And that's like the Muluba people in Congo are like, I liken them to like the Zulus in South Africa. Right. You know, I with a tribe that feels like they were, were carrying the back of the nation. Right, and they mad at the nation on our back. Yeah, so they mad patriotic <laughs> as well. Like you know how. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But um, yeah. So we, we could I couldn't speak any of the languages. We spoke French and Lingala, like most Congolese people, and um. You know, I was, you're thrust into school. Right. And it's tough in the beginning because uh, you can't communicate with anybody and you don't know what's happening and you're anxious um, and you're doubtful of right. your abilities, um, even at that age, um, because you can't communicate with anyone. Mm -hmm, and, mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was really like rough in the beginning, but um, it was cool. I mean, then, then I learned the language really quickly because you're still like in your formative years. Yeah. Um, and I'm in primary school. And uh, uh, I mean, yeah, it was cool, man. I guess outside of that, it was a relatively normal 
upbringing, I guess. Right, right. <laughs> so I know you said you're a storyteller, which is, I think, Cap. You are a storyteller, but you do so many things under that shit. Uh, like, you do quite a lot, yeah. and you're a writer. Um, when did you discover that you were a writer? Was mm. that your first? It was that the first thing you discovered about yourself, like, if you know what I mean, like, amongst all the other things that you do, was that the one thing that you saw that you were good at and you felt like, okay, this is something I need to water in order for it to grow? Yeah, so, I mean, the, I, the way that I look at it, the, 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 the reason I, I don't necessarily um, say I'm a writer, like, mm -hmm. right now, even though I suppose it's the thing that most people... Um, characterize me as right, right. um <clears throat> and because my contributions have also been more notably in writing but the reason i don't necessarily say that is because i look at uh like writing as language right mm -hmm. but I, I i look at it as language because i think like creativity is like the source it's right like the substance right so for instance if you speak french and i speak like Tosa, you know what I mean? We we could be we could be saying the same thing, but we we may not, but we won't arrive there if we don't understand each other. Right. Right. So it's like the common language is what allows us to um, express common ground. Exactly. Right? right. But but it's not the substance. It's like the language is not the substance. Mm -hmm. Um. And I I. I look at like writing as like the language, but like the language for someone else could be like editing or it could be making clothes or it could right. be, you know, and um, for, for, for a really long time, I did identify as a writer. I do still. I just don't define myself by that at this stage in my life because it's like transformative. Um, when, 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 when I started, I thought about myself as a writer and when I started was like mad young. Um, I, we, at, in my household, we always drew pictures and we wrote and we painted and we, you know, just because my brothers and I were very like curious, right. we very curious. We were very inquisitive. My mom is a, is a seamstress, okay. you know, so she would make clothes, um, for us. So it was, it also wasn't something that we were conscious or deliberate about. Mm -hmm. I suppose it was just like what it was. Right. Well, yeah, yeah, yeah. Two brothers, one was a graphic designer, one was a a painter you know one was like he would just draw all the time so it's like what we did to pass time and, right yeah and because we didn't have any anything to do it's like we were just like bored um and you know you don't have mad money so it's like you just entertain yourself like most kids right kids do. so we did a lot of um art art stuff and then i would also i also had i guess like a proclivity to to um, writing because I was really into like reading books like, as a kid, um, and so I would write anything that I could think think about. I would write it down on a piece of paper. I'd write it on the wall, um, and it just became something that write it on the wall. Yeah, I would write stuff <laughs> anywhere that, that I got the opportunity. Your but, parents probably hated you. Yeah, yeah. For more reasons than that, but yeah. <laughs> uh, but but um. Yeah, it's, it, but I never thought about uh, writing or just creativity in general as a, as a commodity. It wasn't like a thing. Right. In, in my mind, it was just like things that you did. In to express movie. yourself, just yeah. to do it. Yeah, you, did, you don't think about that that much as a kid, you know? So, right, um, yeah, 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 yeah. So you, you just did those in between the things that you actually had to do and the things that were actually important. That, right. That, at least that's what... That makes perfect sense. Now yeah. I get it. I totally get it. So yeah. we're basically... You you never really viewed it as um, an occupation. No, I, yeah, not at all. It was just something you felt the need to do because that's how you could express yourself. Yeah, and um, it, and, and it wasn't even like a, at that stage. It didn't feel like a need. It was just like your parents tell you like you have to go to school, and then you uh, when you get home you do some chores or whatever. Whatever you, your your day consisted of, yeah. right? And then in between the things that you had to do, um, you just occupied yourself with stuff. And the ways that I occupied myself was with like writing and drawing stuff, you know. And uh, I honestly, I never thought much about it beyond that. Even further down, later into high school, it only started becoming a thought when 
it was like grade 11 and matric and I realized like oh people are like making plans for what they're going to do for the rest of their life <laughs> and um, I didn't have a clear idea not because I not even because I didn't have options I was like a relatively bright guy you know so I figured I could do most things as long as I didn't have to do complex maths um, <laughs> it, didn't, it, was, it didn't involve like trigonometry or whatever but, right. but, but I just wasn't uh, I was always somebody who did things according to how I felt and I I wasn't sure how I felt about any of the conventional like occupations that they presented to you at career day or whatever right um, so by the end of high school I just my I remember my high school principal said to me you know you should maybe try something in education I think you could you would be really good in something in education and I mean I wasn't feeling that really um, because I had been to school for 12 years and and I would I mean sometimes myself included but like I'd seen how children unfortunately <laughs> treat the teachers and I was like mm, that's not a life for me you know I don't, I don't have that kind of patience or whatever I, you know it's not a life for me and and I told her that I was considering um, studying English literature and she said yo I studied English literature so the principal told me that and she said and it's it was really enriching and 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 I loved it um, and he gave me a great foundation for other things, but you're going to be poor. You know? <laughs> um, she, said, she said, that's what's going to happen. You're, you're, going going to be poor, you're not going to make you know? any money. Yeah, so uh, after high school, I just, I had, I coached basketball for two years um, at my old high school. And, uh, and then I decided that I would apply to university, but I studied by correspondence. I was doing like uh, politics economics and philosophy. Okay. Um, I didn't know what I, I don't know what I thought I was going to do with that, but I figured it was, <laughs> it was more concrete than, than just doing an English literature degree right. and then asking my parents for money for the rest of my life. Um, uh, and, then, and then during that time, uh, I started to write album reviews, right? Uh -huh. And so I had always been writing stuff, like I said, but I had a friend, his name is Nare, and he... Uh, him and I always shared music. Uh, we were really, really, really into music. My, I mean, all of us, my brothers were really into music, but I took it really, really seriously for some reason. And I was into lyrics and I, was, I would, you know, buy the uh, hard copy CDs when they had the sleeves with the lyrics inside. I would always read the lyrics and the credits and, what? and, and, and all that stuff. Did that just come a second nature? I was just curious, man. I was, I was interested. I think in general, like, curiosity has guided, uh, has, has, has uh, informed most of my decisions in life, is that I get curious about something, and then I think I'm just going to find out. That's the service, and you just end up... I end up five years later somewhere, you know. That's, that's fucking crazy. Um, yeah, so I was always just curious because I would hear music, you know, I would listen to, like, you know, the Marshall Mathers LP, and that would like broke my brain as like a 12 year old, all the things like everything right, was saying. Yeah, and, was just, yeah. and so, and then I would go, my brain would go, how did he come up with this? You know, who made the instrumental? Like, where did they record this? And where, so, and the CD pouch was the, the CD sleeve was the way to get that information. So I would just do that, you know, anything yeah. that was in my reach, I would just grab and read. Right, so what do you um, feel, just sorry, before you, sure. you go even further, so how do you feel about the music right now? Seeing that like that whole um, sleeve in an album is something that's missing in terms of like the roller out of music, like in this day and age. I mean, music had just closed like yeah, couple very of, sad. a week ago. Like very they, sad. They closed all their stores. All yeah. their stores are closed down, which is such the like it's such an end of an era um, because of what musical was. I think for me, I've, I've only bought like two hours of my life, like from a musical. Mm. However, I will never forget listening to the albums in Musica. Whether you see the albums there, you put on the earphones and you get depressed. Yeah. When you listen to that, that, that shit was crazy. So yeah. with how you basically developed into not necessarily writing, but reviewing albums, how do you feel about that shit happening right now where the sleeve doesn't exist. <laughs> we actually yeah. don't know where half the shit that we listen to is yeah. made. How it was inspired to, I mean, what inspired it, unless artists have interviews, which barely happens. 
um, artists barely have interviews when they like about to drop an album. Yeah. So, well, I think I think I don't think that the sleeve doesn't exist. I think that it just exists differently. Oh. You know. Uh, ah, I yeah. see. Okay, I, I kind of see how you think. That's okay, cool. <laughs> Yeah, I, I think it just exists differently now. I, the the it's a it's a two way thing. Mm -hmm. um, it's sad that music are closed um, because there's a no lot of nostalgia just with that uh, experience of consuming music. Um, if you grew up in that time, um, it's sad for the people, the human beings that it directly affects. And I'm sad, you know, that I probably won't experience it in that way again, and many other people, but. I also think that when sometimes when things become, uh, we, we could look at them as like becoming extinct or like as a stage in evolution. Mm -hmm. You know, um, it's it's when 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 there's a like just in nature, it's like when there's a vacuum that happens, something quickly uh, uh, just emerges to fill that vacuum. Right. There are no vacuums like yes. on Earth. Yes. You know what I mean? It's like, yes. and, and that's how I see uh, just like things in life like evolving. It's right. Like the, the, the reason, there's a reason that that me medium um, can't exist in the way that right it, now. It, it used to because it doesn't speak to the needs or the values of the generation now. Right. Like what is ours to do when that happens is to look for ways to evolve um, with it, you know? Um, so, so I don't think that the album sleeve doesn't exist. I think that a lot of us think very fondly about it because there's a nostalgia attached to how it used to be. Yeah. The sleeve is just more like vast now. It's yeah. not a physical piece of paper that you're flipping through. Right, so it could be um, an interview or yeah. a vlog yeah. or whatever. Yeah. And, cool. and that's also a cool opportunity for if you're an artist or you know, uh, if you're a musician or in that space to, for us to... Uh, redefine and explore what the multiple versions of the sleeve is now, like in right. 2021. It's like because you're not confined to a piece of paper. Okay. You can make that sleeve whatever you want. And if people want it, they, they'll consume it, you know? That's food for thought for the artists, oh, right? Yeah. Uh, That's a mad food for thought. But yeah, let's get back to your story. Um, so yeah. Um, yeah, so, so I was saying that. Album reviews. That, yeah, so I, I, my friend who lived upstairs, he said to me, like, hey, we, we should just write album reviews or write about so music or whatever, you know, and this is, you know, maybe 2010 or 2009. Okay. And, uh, and, um, and I was like, oh, again, I was already doing that. I was interested in those things. So we started writing album reviews and we would post them on Facebook notes. And um, one day, uh, TTP, who was doing marketing at, Hype Magazine at the time, he is, I think he uh, runs uh, Back to the City now with Osmic and, okay. and that group of people. He, hit, he had hit me up and he said, yo, you know, Osmic, who was the, the editor at Hype Magazine at the time, said, yo, he wants to talk to you. And I was like, okay. I mean, I'd never met Osmic before. I knew who he was because I collected Hype Magazines. Oh, really? Yeah. I mean, I collected Slam Magazines from high, uh, Basketball Magazine. From why? From like, why did you collect the Hype Magazines specifically? Uh, I mean, because I was interested in hip hop. I okay. was interested in music. My, I, had, I had three older brothers, so, you know, I was, I, if they, whatever they listened to, I listened to. Right. From, I heard Lauryn Hill and the Fugees and Puff Daddy and cool right. when I was five years old. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. It's, it's that, that influence. Yeah. yeah, it's that I, influence. I didn't necessarily care for it. It was just like background music in my mind, but I, because I grew up with it, it was a part of me. Right. And, so, and then I got interested in it, and so I collected Slam magazines, Hype magazines, and The Source and Double XL. So, um, I, I, uh, so I went to see uh, Muzi, and he said to me, hey, man, I like how you... You know, I, I read your review, TTP showed it to me, and uh, do you want to write something for me? And I was like, oh, snap. Okay, cool. You know, okay. Uh, how does this work? I went, and, and I told him that I, was actually, I, was, I would be interested in uh, doing a column as opposed to um, just doing album reviews. And uh, I'd gone away for a week and came up with this idea for a column. It was called Hippolytics because I was a politics student, and I thought, 
Hip politics. Uh, yeah, like hip hop and politics. Yeah, yeah, yeah. that's and swag. I mean, I, I hear it now and I'm just like, that's terrible. No, but, it's not <laughs> swag. But, but, <laughs> but um, I, I, I just thought there were a lot of parallels at the time yeah. with how politics work with the bureaucracy and yeah, yeah, the yeah, conflict. Yeah, yeah. And I thought there were a lot of parallels between that and, and, and hip hop, how the game was set up at the time. Yeah. And I was like, I'm going to write a column, uh, a monthly column based on that. And I pitched him the idea. And he thought it was brilliant. So sounds brilliant. And at 19 years old, I got published for the first time. Fuck. And um, by luck, in a nutshell. Yeah. I mean by luck. Well, it's not luck, not, not but you luck. know what I mean. Like I, you never. You, what I mean by luck is, is, is like not necessarily luck, um, but you kind of prepared yourself for what happened, and and you didn't pitch it. Um, so that's what when I say luck, it's like a thing of. It literally fell on your lap, like yeah. literally. I think I think I hoped that uh, I would write in a newspaper or magazine at some point, like when I when I was in high school, right? I thought that that might be a cool thing to do one day, like when I'm 50. Right. You know, that's how I was thinking about it because it wasn't something that was attainable. Uh, that I didn't look at it as something attainable. I didn't know any like professional writers, I right, know any right, 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 or editors. That was like something you saw like on, on television, right? It was like Clark Kent, who is Superman, is also a journalist like <laughs> during the day. I didn't know anybody who did anything. So you had no point of reference. Yeah, and you're still so, able to do it. That's crazy. I mean, I was just, I didn't, I wasn't taking it, I, I wasn't taking it seriously. Like, I hope that this happens. I was like, it would be cool if this happened at some point in my life. Between then and now, I'm going to figure things out with a real job, I suppose, when I graduate. But... Um, I guess I was preparing myself for it without Of course, money. of course. Um, and, yeah, so when that opportunity came, I, I mean, I, of course I was going to do it, you know. So, um, so, I, so I, I did that, yeah. So based, based, based on, like, what, let's say, let's take it back now. So um, what would you say about how you moved and how generation, our generation is today, like in South Africa, like the youth, right, mm. where... Um, we, I can speak from my perspective, right? Like how you could, how you thought about having something or doing something would be cool, whereas in our generation or probably the generations even younger, it's more of the thing of, I'm going to do that and this is what I want because of yeah. the amount of mediums that we see yeah. people do stuff, which makes it much more attainable in our brain. Yeah. So like, would you say that which, which, generation would you think is a bit more progressive because i kind of see how you started off and how you moved with it and it feels way more authentic to me mm. um to do something purely because you like it and purely because it resonates with you other than to do it because you want a specific outcome mm. from it because both things have a different um train of thought you know yeah. what i mean like when you when you're doing something you in um and your intention is to Let's say yield a specific outcome. Yield a specific outcome. Yeah. You move differently. Yeah. But for both sides. So now, which side of the spectrum would you rather find yourself at? Fine, you already found yourself at one spectrum, which obviously worked. But when you look at today, do you think it's a good thing at how everyone is doing something with the intention of? furthering or starting a career in it. I feel like nobody is really doing anything because they like it. Mm. They do it because they like it and because they think it could be monetary. Um, there could be monetary benefits, but they don't do it because they like it. Mm. I, find I think it depends what you, how you view your uh, destination. Right. right? It's, it depends how you define that. I, it, it's it's very. Uh, I think everyone should do things that they like. Of course, you know, 100%. Just, You should always do things that you like because it's integral to like our sanity as human beings, man. You know. And life is way um, too short. Yeah, it's just the everything. You know, think, things. Life can feel very mechanical. Mm -hmm. um, and then everyone's situation is like complex and different, and the things that motivate. Uh, what we do are different. Some people have to do things out of necessity, and that's completely, I, I completely understand that. Right. Um, and some people have the luxury of uh, just following their passions or whatever. 
Um, but I, I, I think that those things can coexist without, um, we don't, we, the, the important thing is not that it becomes our career. Right. If, if, if you get what I mean. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. I, I, I have a friend who is uh, one of the most creative people that I've ever met, and he's an accountant. You know what I mean? It's like that's what he does every single day. And I don't, I mean, I don't think that he's not content in his life. You know, I think he's content because he made the decision that financial security is something that's important to him. It's one of his highest priority. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it, it's something that's important to him. And I think that we should feed the things that we decide are important to us. 100%. You know I mean? it's, it's what we prioritize. And that in itself is a, is a, is a process because um, there's so much of our lives that are decided for us before we're even born. 100%. You know I mean? Because the world and the systems that govern it have existed for hundreds, thousands of years before us. So you're, you're thrust into like this existence thinking that you have free will, but you don't. even on a subconscious yeah. level, you know, when you make decisions, it's like those are affected by other things. And, yes. and, and, and I say all of that to say that, um, I say all of that to say that, that uh, uh, the, the, even the process of like deciding what our priorities are, it, that is a, is a, it's an explorative thing. Right. You know, it's like, you know, people talk about unlearning a lot. Yeah. Like, like today, people talk about unlearning. The concept of unlearning is like the process of discovering who you are. It, and it's a strange thing to say because you would think that every individual would know who they are. No. Nope. Right? I, would not, I wouldn't think that. Not. Uh -huh. I, I, yeah, I suppose. Like on a very surface level, yeah. you would think like, oh, I'm me, so yeah, I know yeah. me. But... But sometimes like the process of discovering that or building that is like a reverse thing. It's like going like, oh, do I actually like, like this thing? Do I actually enjoy this thing? Or do I do it because boom, boom, boom. And then, right. you know, um, I'm exploring that thing. Or like, why do I do this? And why do I do that? I, I think that in my life right now, and going back to why I introduced myself as a storyteller in my life right now, it's like I'm doing so much of that. Um, because I was a writer, and then I worked at an agency, and then I was the editor of Hype magazine, and then I was this, and, I, and it's like there's a definition being defined by like the the, box. the career thing, like right, all the time. Right, like, right, I, I right. Don't, I'm not one of those people that I'm like, oh, I don't want to be defined. It's like you know, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes there's it's important. Definition is important for, right. for certain things, right? I, well, it's important sometimes because, I mean, on a very pragmatic level, I always have this conversation with uh, my business partner, Vaughn. I always say, um, for instance, if you think about the, the awards, if you think about awards, every, every artist is going to tell you that, like, I don't care about awards, yeah, right? They do. Um, and, 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 and most of them do. Just, and there's nothing wrong with that. It's not shallow. It's when you're an artist, you have, you have an innate, like, inclination to share your work with people. Yes. and. And, and, and feel and get the energy back that, that, that you put out there and whatever, right? And, and be celebrated. Why would you not want to be celebrated? And, 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 and here's the thing is because music is so, music has evolved to a place where it's just like this incredible cataclysm of like sounds and genres and it's like it's harder now to go, this is R&B, this is rap, this is jazz, this is, because of that, um, which is great for arts history, right? Yep. When the awards come around, there's, now there's always these conversations. So if, when you're the artist that for the past two years said, I don't want to be called a rapper, I don't want to be called a yeah. jazz artist, I just want to be called an, an artist, right? Yeah. A maker of things. And you don't get nominated in the category because someone respected your wishes and said, oh, well, well, we're, when, when I was, we, we don't, we don't recognize that as R and B because we're not, you know. Then, you, then you're upset, yeah. right? So, so, and I'm saying in that particular, uh, that's an example of where definition can be important. Yes. You know what I mean? But there's things like that in life. There's 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 many things like that in life, and now that's maybe a weak example. But um, I, 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 what I'm saying is. I think that definition is important in life sometimes because we still live in a world that's very uh, cookie cutter. Yeah. So if you have, if you want to get to somewhere, you need to address 
you, you need to approach that path in the way that is understood over there. Yes. You, you get you get me. So so I so I'm not I, I I'm not one of those people who's just like oh I never want to be defined. It's not really the, where this comes from. Where it comes from is is to say that I'm exploring so much um, right now. I'm exploring so much artistically. I'm exploring so much. Um, of myself in terms of introspection, I'm a, I'm, exp I'm I'm just in a very like explorative and inquisitive stage in my life right now that it's it's harder for me to say like my name is Fred and I'm this, right? right? Because like next week you're gonna see me um, doing like balloon animals at a four, at a four year old party and you're gonna be like what the how are you? Yeah, you know, and 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 it doesn't matter. It's like we we could be all those things. Sim we are many things simultaneously. All of us are yes. many things simultaneously. But honestly, when, when, but when people ask you, like, please introduce yourself, have you ever notice that everyone always goes to, like, their name and then what their career is? Yes. Or, like, their name and their job. Yes. It's like that, or, that in That's itself is... Yeah, the, for this uh, issue and um, you know I would help you obviously but I just I, I want you to do it and nobody knew me as well it wasn't like I had so I had credentials in the game like that you know I but 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 I suppose like my curiosity again was um, help me because I was like the f annoying freelancer who would right. who would always be texting her and calling her and asking her so about stuff and you know for it, I'm very curious to hear this right what do you think was like a character defining characteristic that you have that stood out for her? Like, do you think, because I think even when I work with people today, they're very like small things that stand out to me. Yeah. And like how, that's how I know it, whether I can like put my money on someone, where I can like trust yeah. someone. It's like, if you're reliable mm -hmm. and if um, you just invested in bettering yourself. Yeah. Um, there, there's nothing better than working with people like that. Yeah. What do you think she saw, or how do you think you got that post? <laughs> yeah. How did you think she looked at you like, okay, no, this guy, even though his writing is not so great, but he's sending me six different um, articles, which means he's just so invested in the development of himself. Yeah. So what characteristic did you think you had that she was just like, yo, okay, 
this guy, there's someone important that I can define. So my writing was very good. No, I'm just saying, I'm just saying I know. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was, um, no, I was, a, I was, a, I was very, I think, attention to detail. Right. I was very, very, very meticulous. It's like, I think I was more, uh, and I don't think that that was the culture then right. in, in that space in publishing. I, I'm not saying that um, they weren't good writers. I'm saying that people, I guess people looked at Hype Magazine as hip hop first and a publication second. Yes. And I probably put them on the same level. I was like, oh, I need, this needs to be the best thing ever. Like she would get annoyed with me because I would send her a draft and she'd be like, thank you very much, this is great. But then I would send her six drafts afterwards like in the next 24 hours and be like, oh, I changed this and did that. And I, you know, take this paragraph and move it over here, but maybe let's end it this way. And it's like, she didn't have time for that. You know what I mean? She was, she, she, <laughs> yeah, she, yeah, she was the editor in chief. She had, I, I mean, I did, I wasn't thinking about it like that because I didn't know the, the industry, but she had thousands of other things that were way more important than this 800 word one pager. You know what I mean? And six different drops. Yeah. And, I, and, and I suppose she looked at it like, well, I mean, if this guy cares, about this it this much. much. I mean, he if you know he'll probably do a decent job, yeah, I you know. Say. And I um, say. yeah, it was it was probably that. It was probably that. Yeah. And so she gave me a shot, and I, and that first experience of doing that. So I, of waking up and going to the office, mm -hmm. um, at Panorama where they had ten other publications there, right. and uh, it was a a pretty I mean corporate environment, um, and. Uh, I didn't know corporate etiquette. You know, I, yeah. I showed up wearing shorts on my first day, and I remember the HR guy said, you can't wear shorts here, you know, because there's adults here who <laughs> work and do stuff, important stuff, you know. Serious. But, uh, yeah, it was, it was just, it was a very, very, very challenging uh, experience just putting that issue out. It was in two, 2010 or 2011, so I think. Your first issue? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'd, I'd written my first cover story. I'd, uh, I had learned the back end of it. I'd learned um, the distribution. It was very, very challenging. So and, cool. um, and then it came out, and I was like, and again, that feeling was like, whoa, I have to do this forever. Yeah. You know, yeah, I have to do this again and again and again. Um, and and what, to what you were saying about was it the defining, it was the defining time in my life, even now, because... Uh, I mean, fast forward four years later or five years later, when I left Hype Magazine, I started my own little like boutique company slash agency thing. And I called it Breakfast for Dinner because um, it was an homage to that first experience editing that, I guess, editing that issue. Okay. And, and uh, my routine at the time was that I, so I, it was just my brother and I, and he was at school as well. And uh, my routine was that I would go to the office, um, take two taxis back home, and then uh, I would get home at like 8 p.m., you know, because you have to do the thing where you stand in line and yeah. whatever. You know, I'd get home at 8 p.m. and then be so exhausted that I would probably take a nap. And at, I would work between probably one, between like midnight and 5 a.m., 4 or 5 a.m., and uh, many times I would be eating toast or like eggs or bacon or what I mean, because that's what I could afford at the time on the student budget. But it became my routine, and I would be eating breakfast for dinner. For dinner. Right. And 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 when I was thinking later on about what the kind of work that I wanted to do and the impact that I wanted it to have, I was like, oh, I want this the work that I do uh, in this space to speak to everyone who's in that stage of their lives. Who, who, who's like grinding it out um, towards something? Yeah, it's just like a an analogy, exactly like. Exactly. Yeah, so yeah. You took that word based on where you were in your life, and you knowing very well that other people being in that at that same place, and the kind of content that you would be creating should be relatable to those people that are in that period. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, 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 it was just, yeah, it was just like we, if you, especially if you're in the creative field, 
that stage of your life usually lasts longer than just the student thing, right? Because you, you constantly have to like prove yourself when you, you, you're in the creative field. But I was like, it, it, whenever anyone validated my efforts, like in, with Simone in that case, for instance, whenever anyone validated my efforts or someone told me like, oh, you're doing a good job or someone, it, it meant so much during that time because you had so little, right? right? And, right. And, 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 and that's what I wanted to do with what I was doing at the, at the agency, at the, at the company. And mm -hmm. um, I think you, you, you came to one of my events, uh, yeah, the, one. the one at the Bioscope, yeah. right? Um, so it was when you guys were dropping, I think it was a shame. Yeah. It was the one that so you shame. Right, right, right. Yeah, 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 it was a short film. Um, and yeah, I found that really dope because I mean, I still knew you as like Fred from Hyde. Yeah. Um, but I had just recently found out that you just resigned. Um, yeah. And I think it was like a month later after you resigned. Yeah. Or two months. That's when I got the invite. I was just keen to see um, what the next step was for you, like what we were, what your next transition is. And I mean, that, that show was dope. I found it dope. Um, how you guys were working around it was dope. Um, so, why did you resign? I mean, it was just time. It was, it's not, it was nothing big or controversial. I was there for five or six years at that time, and I'd also literally had every possible job you can have, like from freelancer to intern to uh, you know head writer, then managing editor, then editor in chief. It was like, oh, I, this is the the. I think you start a magazine. Why, why? Uh, I mean, no. <laughs> 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 and, and and clearly I made the right decision because you know uh, yeah you know it's it's a, it's a, it's a, I mean not just covid I mean the publishing industry is non non-existent in 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 that way don't you know you think, like you said don't you think this is just a, um, another world of vacuum being filled yeah absolutely 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 um, I think I think I think that's the direction everything we're leading to right yeah as much as there's a lot of online magazines there's a lot of people starting online magazines. Yeah. Which is, there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. I think people are starting it because they think it's easy. Yes. But at the end of the day, I mean, it nothing can ever be easy. Yeah. So that's why a lot of them don't last. Yeah. But there's definitely another vacuum being open. 100%. Um, which is probably going to be moving pictures. Uh, yeah. Moving content. So, so spot on. I, I, I never, at that, at that time when I left, May, I th I'd been thinking about it for a while, and then something happened that just was like, oh, yeah, this is the right move. Um, okay. Something like internal over there happened. I was like, okay, cool. And so I'm just going to do this. I'm going to take this as a sign from the universe to move along. And so I made the decision. I, it was very unsettling because I didn't know what I was going to do. But then leading up to when, to my uh, last days there, um, I had started to think more about myself as like less of a magazine guy or a writer. And then like I figured it out. I was like, oh, the thing that um, makes this job attractive to me is not the medium. It's not the papers. It's not the actual magazine. It's like what I'm actually invested in here are the stories, right? It's like, because so there were things that I enjoyed more than others about the process of putting the magazine together, and all. And I re realized that the thread there was it all had to do with, with stories, right? right? It's in because because those are the things that connect us. I I think to my I wonder how differently my life would have been, if, I had known earlier that, they were that they are people who like write stuff and get published. And that's their job every day. So right. what what I was saying about yeah, yeah, having yeah. no reference in high school yeah. for something like that, right? So and I'm and I'm going like the more we tell stories and the more we 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 share um, our human experiences, like it just does. A ripple effect. It's a ripple effect. It just does more and better for everybody, for everybody right? It's 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 it's, right. it's very very rare to for for, for um, someone to do something that they've never seen, heard, or experienced before, that they have no reference for. And, and the people that do do that are like outliers, or like the, you know what I mean? It's, it's, but even then, there's, 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 
a fragment of it that is referencing something, mm -hmm. right? So, and, and, and that's the, what stories do, is that, is that there's substance there that you share with people. I mean, you, I'm, I'm sure that with what you do, I mean, I know for a fact, because I see it on your Instagram, um, people asking you questions about, you know, how do I do this? And I'm trying to start my own clothing brand. And I'm, yeah. I'm saying that's, 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 that's a, information is, is the most valuable resource, right? right? Yeah, and, yeah. And, and, and stories are a way to spread that information. Mm -hmm. And so I, I started to think about it more like that towards the end of my, and I was like, oh yeah. I mean, someone reads, reads, uh, I, in those years, I'd interviewed every possible person you could imagine, right? Like from like the new school people that were coming out then to the old school, the double HPs and pro kids and Maloom Cool Cats and AKAs and Nas's and Wale's and most Defs. And I mean, these are people who I had conversations with uh, during that period. And I, I, I know that things that we put in that publication um, because I met them every single day in the streets or in my email or in my inbox that said, yo, I used to, I read this article two years ago about, you know, this rapper and I remember this thing that he said and that's why I'm doing this degree now. You know what I mean? Or like I listened to the song, we had the mixtapes, it's like I listened to the song, you know, Ginger Trills, like, oh, I used to listen to the Hype Magazine mixtapes and that made me believe that you know, I could do this thing for real. And then he liked it. I mean, these things have real, real effects in, in real people's lives, right? And, there's, and whose responsibility is it to, to make sure that, like, this information gets, gets out there? You know, it's ours. Some, some, it needs to be someone's responsibility, right? And I started to think about it like that. It's like it, there's some responsibility attached to this. So where someone would think that, this guy's been working in magazines for five years, he's gonna leave and start his own magazine. The thread for me wasn't the medium, it wasn't the magazine. The thread for me was that, was the stories. So my natural, uh, pro I looked at film as a natural progression because I was like, film is moving pictures. So basically, <laughs> you know. uh, you've just been using the whole, um, You've been using your journey as like a tutorial stage type thing where um, you do one thing that propels one's, one of your skills in order to do the next thing a bit better, if not better, if you get what I mean. So let's say for argument's sake you're at Hype um, writing, um, you're writing, and now you're into moving pictures. and you'll be able to write better for the moving pictures. You get what I mean? So it looks like it's just always been a... Yeah. All-around the transition phase type thing. Yeah. I, insane. And I, yeah, and I've been very lucky and very very fortunate too because it, it's, it's never intentional. I'm, uh, I'm, I'm, I would be lying if I said that I was a big planner. I'm trying to work on that some same. more. Um, give me some Yeah. <laughs> I've, I, I will try, try. Yeah, man, it's it's tough, but I, I'm I'm not a big planner. It's just like I really am. I really just go like with what I feel um, a lot, and that's why it's important for me to spend a lot of time figuring out what I feel. Right. You know what I mean? Being close to like feelings, you know. Um, so so I, it, it's not even a thing of that. I go like, okay, I'm gonna do this for two years, for three years, then I'm gonna get to this level. Then when I I'm gonna pivot and do this thing. It, it, it was just like when the, the most important realization for me in the second half of my life was going, was looking at everything that I'd done and going, uh, you know, what are the things that have been the most significant to me, right? And going, okay, the, the Hype Magazine thing, and then going, I mean, in between the Hype and Breakfast for Dinner thing that we're talking about now, there were some things as well that, you know, the, the, there was, um, you know, uh, play and monster energy and yeah, doing that for a year and a half, writing content in the marketing department for them. And there was uh, a few other things that I did, but at that stage, looking at those things and going, what, what, what about this was attractive to me? What about this was attractive to me? Right. What was meaningful? And then looking at the thread and going, oh, you don't typically see someone going from like publishing to marketing and then to uh hospitality and then to yeah. 
like you don't see that, but but there's a thread there because yes. I made those decisions. It, yes. I, I wasn't, I didn't do them under duress. So it conscious. wasn't, I was conscious. I made those decisions. I was like, oh, I've been just chasing the stories. Right. That's what it is. I've been chasing the stories. So, and then the natural progression for me was like, when I was in doing magazines and when I was doing content for these guys, it was like words and pictures. That's what magazines are, words and pictures. 100%. And that's what film is, words and pictures. You're just moving. You're yeah, you know, so I was like, oh yeah, I could totally do this. And I'm interested in it. And I, so I went, I did a film course and um, I just threw myself in there and I invested all of my money into it. And I did everything that I thought that I needed to do at the time. Um, to quote unquote, like earn my stripes, uh, you know, in yeah. in that in that in in that field. But it, it felt like it felt purposeful. It felt like the right thing to do at the time. So, right. okay, yeah. so then, but it's language. Is sorry to interrupt you, but I, but, okay. but 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 it's like what I was saying earlier about like like like, like 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 when I wrote when I was at High Magazine, the language that I had to learn to do that was. Well, language was actual language, right? right? And when, when I was uh, later on at, at, at Monster, the language that I had to learn to do that was in the digital space, right? Because right. We, that, that was the language that I had, to, I had to understand SEOs and I had to understand analytics. Uh, that was the language. And then uh, the language that I've been learning now is visual literacy. Mm -hmm. But, but this, the, the, sort, the stream is the same stream throughout that was going throughout the stream is the same thing it's right. just like learning a new language unlocks your range to explore that creativity to right. expose that creative stream if i had to learn and everyone has i, I don't and it's not that simple either so I, i'm not saying that you could just teach somebody how to sew clothes and they would be a designer i'm saying everyone has like we're we're like uh, we're uh, we have proclivities to things like there's some things that you are naturally going to be better at than me just because that's the makeup yeah. but but when you are a creative person and someone that nurtures that creative um have to grow. source learning languages gives you like a wider range to express that creativity. right right so right. that's that and that's how i had started thinking about it from that point onwards and it's like it's very liberating would you say it makes it easier to be relatable as well when you learn language because i think to a certain degree it does i mean relatable to who to whoever is uh, tapping into um, that info, if you get what I mean. Like, so what, what I've maybe come to understand is like relatab relatability is like one of the fundamentals um, of interacting with people, um, especially when you have something that has to, in that people need to like, not necessarily need to like, but that warms up to people, yeah. um, it needs to be relatable. And that's the easiest way for it to be consumable if it's relatable. So it could be literally relatable to five people. And I think that's why you have a lot of artists that are good in South Africa, or even in the world. You have a lot of artists or musicians that are, they, they sound amazing, but they lack the relatability. Um, people, can't relate to, people can't relate to the substance. And because they can't relate to the substance, it makes it very hard for them to consume, to religiously consume that content. Mm. You know mm. what I mean? Yeah, I feel you. Because there's a, there's a disconnect. Yeah. It's like how American rappers and South African rappers, if you're gonna copy the American model using the words that they use, it's not gonna work in our system or in our country because it's not relatable. Mm. It's, 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 it's like you can't be telling us it's like how people rap about dollars in South Africa, but we definitely use rands. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. I, like... I, 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 I feel you. I, I, I think that so. Um, I don't. So so I don't know that it's a that it's a relate. I mean, relatability is important, but relatability is the 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 reason why I I don't. Oh, I, I don't have that conversation with people is because I think that relata relatability can also be contrived. Like when you tell somebody that, if you tell a rapper that like, yo, people are not going to mess with this because the references are completely lost to who the audience is, right? Mm -hmm. It's like then, you know, someone could take that and go back and just like 
tweak the thing. Yeah. And, and which, I, maybe that's not a bad thing, but like just tweak the thing and then it becomes, the, the music becomes like more like, more contrived and systematic than... Less emotional. That, yeah, and, and not music, you know? Right. Um, I think that that's, it's important to be Tricky. careful about the decisions that you make because you are, you are part when you are making music that you release with the hope of people, um, with the hope of people consuming it, you, you, you're participating in the commercial space, so you have to think about it. It's not just like, I'm gonna go in my creative dungeon and like whatever comes out comes out. It's yeah. Like, but 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 um, I also think that it's 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 yeah it's 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 important that uh, uh, we don't just like give people the information that way. I think that instead of looking at it like relatability, it's like there's no reason why someone rapping in South Africa should not be relatable to people listening in South Africa because you share the same circumstance, right? Yeah, yes. Right. So so it's not. It's not necessarily a relatability problem. It's, uh, that's what I'm saying. It's, it's a thing of just, when you are the rapper, it's like, where are you going to in your head? That, like, where, where's the place that you're going to in your head that you're making that music from? It's like, that's what needs to be adjusted. Right. You know, it's, it's cause you can, get you. You can get definitely you. relate to like Bonga, who's like listening to your music because you grew up on the same street. Yes. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yes. It's, it, you grew up on the same street. It's just like the place that you're creating from is weird. Yeah, that's probably it. I totally get you. Yeah. Okay, so before we wrap it up, what are you do? What are you doing now? Uh, what am I doing now? I. This is a fun, but probably unwanted, piece of information. Is I have paint on my testicles right now. Okay. Um, I'm being dead serious. I was at a shoot last night uh, where we had a lot of paint going on, <laughs> and it seeped through my pants, and I need to get some turpentine after I leave this interview to make sure that I don't know what's the worst case scenario <laughs> in this, in this situation. Um, but, but what am I doing now is um, I run an agency um, called Coalition right. uh, with uh, my business partner Vaughn. So we have a setup uh, under um, uh, Stain Events, okay. Stain Entertainment. Um, and he heads up the, the record label side uh, under Stalo. And I hit up a, a coalition, the agency, and we serve each other. We've got some really, ex just a really exciting and really sincere and cool, like dynamic going on there with just the people who are working with. Um, uh, yeah, and and uh, yeah, we. That's what I'm doing right that's, now. That sounds fucking amazing. Yeah, we're just trying to take all of what we did individually. And put it together. Uh, and put it together and take it to the next level. That's crazy. Vaughn's I mean, been on the show, so you know him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's, yeah. He's, of course, of course. He's, he's really dope. He's been doing his thing for years, and we've been friends for three years now. And we started working together about two years ago officially. And, uh, you know, it's uh, Coalition and Stalo uh, at the moment, yeah. That's right, dope. Okay. What would you like to leave for the viewers? What would I like to leave for the viewers? Yeah, like food for thought. Um, if you love food for thought, anything inspirational, I guess. I don't know. Um, just like something you think someone who wants to be, or someone that wants, not necessarily someone else to be like you, someone that wants to take the same steps and um, want to follow your footsteps, what would you say they should do? What should they look out for? What? It's like words of inspiration, I guess. Oh, man. I feel like I'm on Oprah. <laughs> you are. <laughs> um, words of inspiration. Uh, I mean, all, all, the, all the corny stuff that people tell you is like, all the corny stuff that you hear and you read on those like Hewlett sugar packages, yeah. like that's all true. Everything they tell you in Sunday school, <laughs> everything that you, your parents tell you, it sounds um, trite and cliched because there's like truth in them, you know? And so I always just go back to, um, you know, the most, I mean, the most important thing for me is just to be honest with myself, you know, and that's a, that's a very difficult thing to do um, for many people, you know, and, but, but a lot of, a lot of, uh, that's the source of everything, man. You know what I mean? It's like being, is being honest with yourself. Yeah. Now you're, you're like, oh, I feel like I want to open, but that's such an honest, that's such a, profound thing to say because um, 
sounds very simple, but it's not. And yeah. It unlocks so many parts of your everyday life and your mind. Yeah. But and it, and and it's something that we that you practice also. It's not like a place that you get. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? It's something that you practice like, like daily, hourly, and just being like yeah. honest with yourself because I, I that's there's a lot of freedom in that. You know, it's like it, it's hard, man, to live on Earth. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's 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 hard to live on Earth, man. It's like everything is like it's complicated to be a human being, and and uh, just the more freedom and that you have, um, it makes the experience a little more bearable, I guess. Right. And and how I look for that freedom is by just being honest with myself. So, um, yeah. That's how we end it. End it. Thank you, everybody. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your data as well. Wh wh whoever comes on here next must ask Bangy to introduce himself. Because, oh, yeah. That's a, bar. I hope whoever's going to come next. Yeah. Because he's always doing it to people and, you, and, and everyone gets caught off guard. Yeah. It's like, yeah, just introduce yourself. It's like, uh, existential yeah. crisis. Uh, I don't know who I am. But yeah, thank you everybody for coming on to um, spend. I mean, ooh, 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 ooh. let me take it back again. Thank you everybody for your time. Um, this is the first episode of season three. And from Fred and I, we are out. Bless up. Thank you, man. Thank you, man. And you're live on Dead Radio. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>